Now, today we will start the description of rotodynamic machine. As I have told earlier, the rotodynamic machines are those machines where there is a continuous motion of fluid and a part of the machine known as rotor. And because of this continuous relative motions between the fluid and the rotor of the machine, it is possible for an energy transfer to take place between the fluid and the rotor. So, therefore, the basic principle of this machine is based on the fluid dynamic principle, fluid dynamic principles, which is basically the utilization of useful work due to the force exerted by a fluid striking on a series of curved vein, which is mounted on the periphery of a disc that is rotating the periphery of a disc that is attached to a rotating shaft. So, therefore, to understand the basic principle of a rotodynamic machines, we should understand clearly the force interaction and the energy transfer that takes place while a stream of fluid passes through a curved vein. So, this is a little recapitulation of what you have already studied at your basic fluid mechanics course that we study here the interaction of force and energy in the flow of fluid along a curved vein. Now, see here this is a curved vein which is moving with a velocity u and a jet of fluid is striking the vein with a velocity v 1 is the velocity absolute velocity with which the fluid strikes the vein. And the fluid after flowing through this vein comes out with a velocity v 2, this is the velocity v 2. Since the vein is moving with a velocity u, so the jet appears to strike the vein that means with respect to the vein the jet strikes it with a velocity v r 1 which is the velocity of the jet relative to the vein. Similarly, it is going out with a velocity v r 2 that is the relative velocity of the fluid with respect to the vein. Now, these relative velocities at inlet and outlet are determined just by vectorial subtraction from v 1 the velocity u of the vein and from v 2 the velocity u of the vein. So, this vectorial subtraction is shown in terms of the velocity triangles as we have already read at the inlet and outlet. Now, let the suffix 1 refer to inlet condition and suffix 2 refers to outlet condition. Now, we see in this triangle this is v 1 that inlet velocity of the fluid, this is the u the vein velocity and this is the v r 1 that is the relative velocity of fluid with respect to vein at inlet. This component, this perpendicular component to the motion of the vein is denoted as v f 1 and is usually known as flow velocity. Similarly, the component of the fluid velocity absolute fluid velocity in the direction of the vein motion is conventionally symbolized as v w the suffix 1 is at the inlet. So, this v w I tell you this is a conventional symbol w stands for whirl whirling component this is because in actual case this velocity of the vein is in the tangential direction because the motion of the vein mounted on the periphery is a rotating motion. So, therefore, the linear velocity of the vein is in the tangential direction and that is why this component is known as tangential component or whirling component for which a conventional symbol w is given as this suffix. Similar is the case in case of an outlet velocity triangle this is the vein velocity this is the relative velocity of the fluid with respect to vein and this component is the whirling component or the component of the flow velocity in the direction of the vein velocity and this is the flow velocity that is the direction of the that is the sorry the component of the fluid velocity in the direction perpendicular to the vein velocity. Now, our basic purpose in this case is to analyze what is the force exerted by the fluid on the vein or vice versa vein on the fluid 
and by virtue of the vein motion which is the what is the amount of energy that is being transferred or developed due to this force due to this action of the fluid on the vein. So, to analyze this as you know we apply the momentum theorem. Now, to apply the momentum theorem we have to take a control volume of the fluid like this which is just adjacent to the vein. Now, you see that this type of analysis can be done on the basis of both system approach and the control volume approach. Now, in a system approach what is done the Newton's law is applied in a sense that you consider a particular mass of fluid and consider its change of momentum as it flows along the vein, find out the change of momentum in a specific direction. And in control volume the same thing is done, but the version is different we find the momentum efflux net momentum efflux in a particular direction and equates this with the force in that particular direction. So, if you if we apply this theorem for a steady state situation the situation is steady then we find that if f x is the force acting on the control volume in the direction x then it will be the net rate of momentum efflux from the control volume in that direction x because we are interested in the direction x that is the direction of the vein velocity the force in that direction. So, the expression on the right hand side is either the net rate of momentum efflux x momentum efflux from the control volume or from a system approach it is the change of momentum change of momentum in the x direction of a fluid mass taken as a system in either way you can see it and that becomes equal to the force is equal to the change of momentum times the mass flow rate. Now, you see the velocity at the outlet is v r 2. Now, here we have to consider the relative velocities because in this case the control volume is moving with the velocity u since the vein is moving with the velocity u. This is an inertial control volume. So, the coordinate axis will be fixed to this control volume. So, therefore, the velocities which we have to take are the relative velocities. So, you see the component of the velocity in the direction of vein velocity here the if beta 2 is the angle made by v r 2 with the direction of vein velocity it will be minus v r 2 cos beta 2 because this direction is opposite to that of the vein velocity or to that of the positive direction of the specified axis x. This is the momentum a flux minus the momentum in flux that means v r 1 cos beta 1, beta 1 is the angle made by the relative velocity with the vein direction. So, this component is in the direction of the vein velocity or in the positive direction of x. So, minus sign is that because it is the efflux minus influx. So, both the terms are with a minus sign. So, it comes out. So, minus m dot. Now, this v r 1 cos beta 1 or v r 2 cos beta 2 if you see from this triangle. So, this comes out to be v w 1 and v w 2. So, therefore, we say that force on the vein is equal to minus f x that means, this is the force that is being acted on what that is being acted on the control volume. So, the force acting on the vein is in the opposite direction that means, if this is the f x it is the in opposite direction of f x minus f x. Now, power developed due to the motion of the vein is then force into the velocity that is m dot v w 1 plus v w 2 into u, u is the vein velocity. So, this way we can develop an expression for the power developed due to the action of the fluid passing over a curved vein. I think you have understood it all right. So, from this triangle two triangles you can get from here triangular relationships geometry that it is v w 1 plus v w 2 and this this minus sign is because the force which is acting on the fluid element or the control volume is in the opposite direction to the specified axis that means, in a direction opposite to the vein motion. So, therefore, the force on the vein is in the direction of the vein motion. However, the expression for power develop is written as the multiplication of f x and u they are in the same direction. So, they are 
absolute values are taken. Well, okay. Now, yes, please. V r 2 cos beta 2 is not V w 2 plus u and here it is V w 1 minus u that cancels out actually. So, ultimately you get V w 1 plus V w 2, yes correct. V r 2 cos beta 2 is not V w 2, it is V w 2 plus u. On the other hand, V r 1 cos beta 1 is also not V w 1, it is V w 1 minus u. If you substitute that, automatically it cancels out and becomes because I felt that you have already done it at your basic fluid mechanics course. So, this thing you know. Well, okay. Very good. I am happy that you are asking questions. Now, we come to the basic equation of energy transfer in rotodynamic machines. Now, in a rotodynamic machines, what happens is that the rotor of the machine is a rotating wheel on which the vanes are mounted and the wheel is mounted on a shaft where the rotation is imparted. So, in this case the same principle is applied here and we analyze this in the similar fashion with the help of a diagram here which is the general representation of a rotor or the representation of a rotor of a generalized fluid machines. Now, components of flow velocity in a generalized fluid machine. Here, in a most general sense, we consider the rotor where the fluid enters at a velocity v1 at any point whose radius of rotation from the axis is r1. Now, before that, I like to mention you that there are few assumptions for this analysis. One assumption is that the flow is steady. So, there is no mass accumulation, no mass depletion anywhere in the system and number two assumption is that flow is uniform over any cross section normal to the flow velocity which is very important and that means that the velocity vector at a point is representative of the flow over a finite area. That means we analyze with respect to a velocity vector at a point and we assume that this is uniform over the entire flow area that is an area normal to the flow velocity. So, that this is the representative of the entire flow through the fluid machine. Well, so with these assumptions now we consider that at any point the velocity vector is v 1 that is the inlet point a very general case whose radius of rotation from the axis of rotation is r 1. Similarly, the fluid goes out or discharges at a point from the rotor whose radius of rotation from the whose radius sorry whose radius from the axis of rotation is r 2. Now, the velocities v 1 and v 2 can be resolved into three components. There may be an arbitrary angle at which the velocity flow velocity strikes the rotor which can be resolved into three reference directions. One is in the direction of tangential one in, in the direction of tangent, the tangential direction which is the tangent to the rotor at that point. Another is the direction which is the axial direction that means, it is parallel to the axis of the shaft and another is the radial direction which is perpendicular to the axial direction. So, these three perpen mutually perpendicular directions the velocities are resolved. One is the tangential direction, another is the axial direction, another is the radial direction. So, these three perpendicular directions and accordingly symbolized as V w, one is the suffix at inlet that is the tangential component, <coughs> whirling component that is why the suffix w is used. The suffix a V a is the axial component that is component parallel to the axis of the rotation. And as I have told earlier the symbol f is used V f one for the inlet that is the flow velocity that is in the radial direction. Similar way the velocities are resolved in tangential direction as V w 2 at the outlet, the axial direction V a 2 and the flow direction V f 2. Now, the rotor is moving with an angular velocity omega, it is a constant angular velocity, this is a steady state problem. Well, now let us apply the momentum theorem or the Newton's laws of motions 
either with respect to a system or a control volume here. Now, here the momentum which will be considered is the angular momentum. This is because here the work transfer takes place due to the rotation of the shaft. So, we will be considering the angular momentum or moment of the momentum. It is very simple. If we consider a system approach, our version will be that considering a fluid mass as it passes from the inlet to outlet, what is its change in angular momentum? Or if we consider a control volume of a fluid, then what will be the net rate of a flux of the angular momentum from the control volume. Now, here one thing is very important, we are not bothered about the path in the rotor. It is only the inlet and outlet that decides the change, because if the inlet and outlet conditions are fixed, kinematic conditions are fixed and the mass flow rate is steady. So, the change in momentum or the moment of the momentum, whatever you say, depends upon the inlet and outlet conditions. Well, now if we write the momentum, moment of the momentum at the inlet for a unit mass at inlet, what will be its value? At inlet, at inlet, okay, at inlet, moment of the momentum moment of the momentum is equal to that is the moment of the tangential momentum that means v w 1 times the r 1 radius from the axis of rotation. It is per unit mass per unit mass. Similarly, the same thing at outlet, at outlet, the same thing at outlet is equal to V w 2 into R 2. So, therefore, per unit mass, the change in the moment of the momentum of a fluid mass or the net rate of a flux of the moment of the momentum per unit mass from a control volume will be V w 2 R 2 minus V w 1 R 1. And that multiplied by the mass flow rate, that means this will be the net rate of angular momentum efflux or the rate of change of angular momentum rate of angular momentum, net rate of angular momentum efflux when we refer it to a control volume, that is a control volume approach, control volume of the fluid or it is the net rate of change of angular momentum for a system as it passes from inlet to outlet. So, in both the cases that equals to the torque, that is the angular momentum theorem, that is the angular momentum theorem applied to a system or to a control volume. The torque is equal to the rate of change of angular momentum of a system or torque is equal to the net rate of angular momentum a flux from a control volume at steady state. So, that is equal to the torque that is being imparted on the fluid by the rotating disc. Now, the energy, rate of energy that is being imparted to the fluid will be nothing but this torque into the angular velocity omega and that if we multiply the angular velocity and recognize that omega r 1 is the velocity of the linear velocity, the tangential velocity of the rotor at inlet and omega r 2 is the linear or tangential velocity of the rotor at outlet and denoting them by the symbol u, we can write v w 2 u 2 minus V w 1 u 1. So, therefore, we see that energy transfer per unit time, the rate of energy transfer in the fluid as it passes from inlet to outlet becomes equal to the mass flow rate m dot flowing times V w 2 u 2 minus V w 1 u 1, where u 2 and u 1 are the tangential velocity, that is the linear velocity of the rotor at the 
outlet point and u1 is that at the inlet point because in a generalized case we have to consider that inlet and outlet are not in the same radius from the axis of rotation there is not at the same radial plane so this is the general equation and here in this equation we see that this is the energy rate of energy fluid now if we write the rate of energy as e dot then we can write this is just the negative of that m dot into v w 1 u 1 minus v w 2 u 2 where we tell that here e dot is the rate of energy that is being supplied to the rotor by the fluid conventionally we take the positive sign of this energy transfer when it is being transferred by the fluid to the rotor or the machine so therefore we always express in this fashion this can be expressed as per unit mass basis that means the energy transfer per unit mass e dot by m dot is equal to v w 1 u 1 minus v w 2 u 2 as you know in fluid flow we define a term head what is head what is the definition of head sometimes we call that is a pressure head is a velocity head potential head total head what is the definition of head height yes energy can be expressed in terms of the height height of the fluid column because head is expressed in terms of the linear dimension but what is the definition it implies the concept of energy what is that the height of a fluid implies the concept of pressure sometimes it co concept of energy it implies the concept of energy also it is the energy per unit weight for a fluid flow it is the energy per unit weight. if you see the dimensions you will see the dimension of energy per unit weight is the height for example the height of a liquid column exerts the pressure at the base and at the same time it has due to that pressure has a pressure energy and pressure energy per unit weight is that height okay so therefore it is the energy per unit weight is the height so therefore we express it as the energy per unit weight that means with a g and the expression comes like this g v w 1 u 1 minus So therefore, these three equations, they are dependent equations, any one of them is called as Euler's equation, these are known as Euler's equation. According to the name of the scientist, this is known as Euler's equation. This should not be confused with the Euler's equation of motion, this is the Euler's equation for fluid machines. This is comes from the equation of motion, but another Euler's equation you have already read in your fluid mechanics class that is the equation of motion for an invisible fluid. It is a generalized equation of motion for flow of an invisible fluid. But this Euler's equation is the equation for the energy transfer between the fluid and the rotodynamic machines. This is the form where the rate of energy transfer is given, that is the energy transfer per unit mass, and this expression is the energy transfer per unit weight or head sometimes we call it as head here you can write head h that is the head transfer now it is very simple you can understand that when when v w 1 u 1 is greater than v w 2 u 2 this quantity is more than this this e dot is positive h is positive that means energy is being transferred to the rotor. We get mechanical energy from the fluid, from the stored energy in the fluid. While Vw, when it is the reverse, that is Vw2 is greater than Vw2 u2, I am sorry, Vw1 u1, that means this is greater than this, this is greater than this. Then this is negative means the energy is transferred from the rotor to the fluid as it passes from its inlet to outlet. So, if for turbines 
as we know that classifications depending upon the direction of energy transfer. This is always greater than this, the Vw1 u1 is always greater than Vw2 u2. And in case of compressor, where the mechanical energy is being imparted to the fluid by the rotor of the machine, Vw2 u2 is greater than Vw1 u1. Now, I will come to the different components of energy transfer. Different components of energy transfer means that how we can express the basic Euler's equations in a different fashion where we can recognize that the energy transfer between the fluid and the rotor <coughs> consists of different components which are which have their very interesting physical <coughs> implications. To analyze that, let us consider the velocity triangles for a generalized rotor. Now, this is a rotor, a generalized rotor, where we show the inlet and outlet part of the vane, <coughs> rotating vane, <coughs> with the radius of rotation at R1 and R2. That is nothing different from the earlier picture, but with the velocity <coughs> triangles drawn in inlet and outlet. Here we see the inlet velocity is V1 and the relative velocity of the fluid is V R 1. This is the whirling component of the inlet velocity. This is the velocity of the rotor at the inlet, linear velocity or tangential velocity. Now, in this context, I like to tell you that probably you know that the relative velocity should be such that it should approach the vane without shock that for a shock and smooth approach of the fluid to the vein, so that fluid can glide along the vein, the relative velocity should make an angle with the direction of the vein motion, which is same as the angle of the vein at its inlet. So, therefore, the vein angle at the inlet is same as the angle of the relative velocity, beta 1. So, therefore, we will consider henceforth the angle of the relative velocity with any direction, for example, here in the direction of the vein velocity is equal to the vein angle at that point. Similarly, here you see the outlet velocity triangle is shown, where V2 is the velocity of discharge of the fluid and Vr2 is the relative velocity of the fluid at discharge whose angle is beta 2 with the tangential direction. That is the same angle the vein makes at the outlet with the tangential direction. That is the outlet vane angle. So, this beta 1 is the inlet vane angle. Now, this u 2 is the tangential velocity or the linear velocity that is in the tangential direction of the vane at the outlet. Now, alpha 1 is the angle with the angle which the velocity v 1 at the inlet makes. Similarly, alpha 2 is the angle which the velocity v 2 at the outlet makes with the tangential direction. Now, these velocity triangles gives the picture of the relative velocities and the absolute velocities at the inlet and outlet of a generalized rotor. The V f 2 and V f 1 are the flow velocities at the outlet and inlet. Now, if we apply certain trigonometric formula for the triangles, we see if at the inlet triangle we can write, I think you can see that V r 1 square is equal to V 1 square plus U 1 square minus twice U 1 V 1 cos alpha 1 or equal to we can write V 1 square plus U 1 square. Now, V 1 cos alpha 1 is the whirling component or tangential component of the <coughs> velocity at the inlet u 1 v w 1. Okay. Can follow. Similarly, from the outlet triangle, we can develop the same relationship v r 2 square is equal to v 2 square that means v 2 square plus u 2 square 
plus u 2 square sorry this 2 will be big minus twice u 2 v 2 cos alpha 2 or we can write v 2 square plus u 2 square minus twice u 2 v w 2. Well, from the two velocity triangles, all right. Okay. Now, from here, therefore, we can write that not from here, sorry, this is from this step, not from this step. From this step, we can write that v w 1 u 1 is equal to half v 1 square plus u 1 square minus v r 1 square. And from this step, we can write v w 2 u 2 is equal to half okay, v 2 square plus u 2 square minus this thing v r 2 square. Now, if you see this expression with this expression and if you recollect the Euler's equation, Euler's equation was that energy transfer or head, let us consider the head that is being given to the machine by the fluid. If you recollect, it was 1 by g, 1 by g, v w 1 u 1 minus v w 2 u 2. That is the amount of energy per unit weight that is being transferred from the fluid to the rotor. So, just by mere substitution, a very simple mathematics, I am telling in fluid ma machines, mathematics are not as complicated as you have in fluid dynamics, no partial differential equations ordinary differential equation. This is very simple because in uniform flow, we only deal with uh, some algebraic steps. So, if we just substitute this, we will get 1 by 2 g, three distinct terms we will get. One is v 1 square minus v 2 square. Another is u 1 square minus u 2 square and another is plus v r 2 square minus v r 1 square. So, this is another form of the energy equation. It is not an independent equation just by exploiting the relationship between the velocities from the velocity triangles at inlet and outlet. We have just expressed this expression into a different forms showing distinctly the three components as the energy transfer components in case of fluid machines. And next part will be the discussion or the physical implication of these three components. <coughs> Thank you today. I will stop here that I will discuss in the next class. Okay. Good morning, uh, welcome you to this session. Uh, we will discuss today the energy transfer <coughs> in fluid machines part 2 in continuation of our earlier discussion. <coughs> now, last in last discussion, we have recognized that the energy transferred to the rotor of the machine by the fluid in terms of the energy per unit weight 
which is known as head can be expressed as just let me write 1 by 2 g v 1 square minus v 2 square plus u 1 square minus u 2 square plus v r 2 square minus v r 1 square. So, in last last session we have <coughs> recognized that the energy per unit weight that is the head transfer to the fluid rotor can be split up into three distinct components where the nomenclatures are like this we can have a recapitulation that where v1 v2 u1 u2 vr2 vr1 are like this that v1 and v2 are the absolute velocities of the fluid at inlet and outlet of the rotor u 1 and u 2 are the tangential velocities of the rotor at inlet and outlet. These are the rotor velocities, wheeling velocities of the rotor at inlet and outlet and v r 1 and v r 2 are respectively the relative velocity of the fluid with respect to the rotor at inlet and outlet. So, if v 1, v 2, u 1, u 2, v r 2, v r 1 are defined like this, we can express the head that is transferred to the machine by the fluid as it flows through the rotor vanes can be written like this. Now, we see that these three terms have got their different physical implications. Now, let us see first <coughs> what is the term v 1 minus v 2 square. This implies a change in the velocity head of the fluid or a change in the kinetic head, kinetic energy per unit weight of the fluid or simply it can be told as dynamic head, dynamic head. You can write a change in dynamic head, change in, change in dynamic head, this, this one, change in dynamic head. So, therefore, due to the change in the dynamic head of the fluid, that means due to the change in its absolute velocity as it flows past the veins the work is being transferred or energy is being transferred to the machine. Similarly, this term represents a change in the head due to the change in its position, radial position with respect to the axis of rotation. When a fluid has got a rotational velocity and it changes its radial position with respect to the axis of rotation, there occurs a change in the head or energy in the fluid. Now, this term can be better understood if we see this one. Let us consider a container where the fluid is flowing in this direction and container is given an angular rotation omega like this. The basic objective is to show that when a fluid element under a rotational velocity changes its position in radial coordinates with respect to the axis of rotation. Let this is the axis of rotation at this point perpendicular to this plane of the figure about which the container is rotating. Then we can show that the work is either being done on the fluid element or work is being extracted from the fluid element. How we can show? Now, let us consider a fluid element at a radius r of thickness <coughs> dr and area d. Now, you know that whenever there is a rotational flow field, it induces a pressure gradient, a pressure variation in the flow in the direction of the flow exists, for which the pressure in the positive direction, this direction of the r is higher than that at this upstream plane. So, therefore, if we take the force balance of the fluid element, we see the net force acting on the fluid element in the radially inward direction is can be written as P plus d P into d A, where d A is the cross sectional area of the fluid element minus P d A. Well, which can be written as d P d A. 
So, what is DPDA? Is the net force in the radial inward direction, let we denote it by F that is equal to dp into dA. Now, this radial inward force balances this centrifugal force due to the rotational motion of the fluid element. So, this radial inward force balances the centrifugal force of the fluid element under rotational velocity. So, what is the centrifugal force? What is the centrifugal force? Let F c for the fluid element, it is the elemental mass d m <coughs> times the linear velocity due to this rotation that is the tangential velocity v square by the <coughs> radius or the radial location from the axis of rotation. This can be written in terms of the angular velocity as d m omega square r. This is the usual expression of the centrifugal force which is acted on this fluid element. Now, if we substitute the mass in terms of the area and the other geometrical dimension and the density of the fluid element, we can write it rho d a d r. So, rho d a d r is the mass of the fluid element. So, this is the angular velocity square into r. Now, at equilibrium, these two are equal. That means, the fluid motion is possible in this direction provided there is a balance between the centrifugal force and the <coughs> inward radial pressure force. So, if we write this, we get the expression d p into d a is equal to rho d a d r omega square into r. So, d a cancels out. Well, we can write then d p d r is equal to rho omega square r. This equation is a very well known equation in the fluid flow with rotational velocity and is known as radial equilibrium equation. This is known as radial equilibrium equation. I can write it that radial <coughs> radial equilibrium equation. This equation simply implies that when there is a rotational velocity in a flow field and fluid flows in the radial direction, then a inward radial pressure gradient is imposed on the flow field which provides the necessary pressure forces to be balanced with the centrifugal force. You know that in any rotational motion of inner solid body, there is there are two forces that are in balance with each other. One is the centrifugal force which tends to make it flying away from the path and another the centripetal force which is a force which makes it possible to have the rotational motion which is inward towards the center of rotation. So, this centripetal force is provided by the pressure gradient through this pressure force. This is the well known radial equilibrium equation. Now, if I write this in a little different form the same equation can be written as d p by rho is equal to d p by rho is equal to omega square r d r. Now, if I integrate this equation d p by rho integrate this equation <coughs> omega square r d r between two points 1 and 2, between two points 1 and 2, which physically indicates the two points, let 1 is at the inlet and 2 is at the outlet. It may be any two points in the flow field. 1 is an upstream point and 2 is a downstream point, which may be at the inlet and outlet in a flow passage. Okay? Well, then we can write this 1 by 2 dp by 0 is called to half omega square r 2 square minus omega square r 1 square, which is nothing but half the linear velocity or the tangential velocity due to the rotation at the point 2, the section 2 minus u 1 square. What is the meaning of this? Now, what is this d p by rho from 1 to 2 integral. This is the flow work, 
flow work. Now, I come to the concept of flow work now. If you recollect thermodynamic general energy equation, you know what is flow work. Let us recapitulate a little bit of thermodynamic concept. You know when you have a closed system, when you have a closed system and it interacts with the surrounding in terms of work, either work is being developed by the system to the surrounding or is absorbed from the surrounding to the system, mechanical work if you consider, the most usual form is by the displacement of the system boundary by the displacement of the system boundary for a closed system because the mass within the system is fixed and under reversible condition this work transfer is written as P dV where dV is the P cut, dV is the change in the volume. So, the integral is made between the two state points 1 and 2. Well, but what happens when the system is, a, is an open system? That means, in thermodynamics we know there are two types of system. One is the closed system where the mass is fixed with the same identity that is known as control mass system usually we tell as system. Another system is there where the mass is not fixed with the identity there is a continuous flow of mass in and flow of mass out where the volume is controlled. Volume is fixed known as control volume system and usually we tell as open system or a control volume. So, in case of an open system or a control volume that means an open system open system or a control volume there is a continuous influx of mass and energy continuous mass coming and mass going out similarly in this control volume if it interacts with surrounding in the form of work that means if it develops work or it absorbs work which comes in our case of fluid machine. A fluid machine is an open system. Continuously the fluid comes into the machine at one part and it goes out of the machine. By virtue of which the machine develops work to the surrounding in the form of shaft work. In some machines it is being developed to the surrounding, the shaft work is being obtained by us and in some cases the machine absorbs the work from the surrounding. That means the work is being put to the shaft in the form of the shaft work. This is a case of compressors and pumps while the work is obtained in case of turbine. So, how to find out this work in this case? In these cases, we write the steady flow energy equation. This is a little recapitulation of your thermodynamic concept, so that you can recognize or appreciate the term dP by d rho as the flow work. So, what is that? If we write the thermodynamic equation, general energy equation of thermodynamics at section 1 and 2, then we can write that the internal energy at 1 u 1 associated with the mass flux plus the pressure energy which is written in thermodynamics in terms of the specific volume rather than the density plus we write the kinetic energy V 1 square <coughs> by 2 per unit mass basis if we write. So, if we consider the potential energies at this and this sections are given like this if we denote Z 1 and Z 2 are the elevations from reference datum. So, this quantity represents the amount of energy influx per unit mass with the mass flow coming into the control volume. Similarly, the amount of energy going out from the control volume associated with the mass flux out of the control volume per unit mass will be the same energy quantities with their values at the outlet section denoted by the suffix 2. I am sorry per unit mass means this will be G z 1. So, this will be G z 2. 